In this video, I'm gonna be showing you how to crush everyone using the Karokan, but uh, I think specifically those that are rated below 1500 will be the ones to benefit the most for this video. However, I think the information that I'm about to provide could be used in like uh, sort of any rating range because uh, we're gonna be trying to fix some uh, solid fundamentals while trying to ignore all the fancy and complicated tactics that usually you need to be quite an experienced player in order to even consider and for that I'm gonna be jumping into some games specifically using the Karo Khan explaining my thinking process as an international master on how you can uh, easily exploit lower rated opponents we're getting another game this time against uh 700 rated opponent from the uh what it looks to be like the uk sticking with a caro finally some exchange i've been like playing only advance i really wanted to get a little bit of variety it seemed like they're just playing the advance very often in this uh rating range opponent goes knight f3 Usually the most ambitious way to start this is bishop d3 with c3, which nobody really plays. I think below 2000, knight f3. Typical mistake, bishop g4. Don't do that because after h3 you have an awkward position. Giving up the bishop pair there is not ideal. And uh, bishop h5, g4 plus knight e5 is very uncomfortable. So we do knight c6 first and then bishop g4. So when the knight lands, we can exchange it. Typical move for uh, this elo. Bishop to b5 now. I think if you really want to be precise, you can play queen a5 check. Because we're misplacing uh, his knight on c3. And then we do bishop g4. Very important and uh, need to be careful on the move order. Only trick, bishop d2, rook c8. But that's something that nobody really plays. Now I'm just going to go uh, knight to f6. Thinking also to start rook c8, but it's a little weird to play bishop c6, rook takes on c6, but I'm just gonna stick with the natural play. Knight f6, if h3, as a rule of thumb, uh, it's always good to take on f3 in the exchange when the enemy knight is on c3. Just so you know, queen to e2, not doing much. e6 is like the most tempting move, also could play rook c8 if I wanna be like super subtle with this, but I'm just gonna keep it simple h3 once again gonna be exchanging that's a move <laughs> all right that definitely took me a little bit by surprise i mean sure we cannot take it because of the pin but what is the threat are you playing queen e5 just trying to show me that you learned the pin what is this i mean <laughs> just gonna take on f3 mess up his pawn structure then try to finish development while avoiding any knight x on d5 type of tricks. We messed up his structure, bishop e7 castle next, just keeping it super simple. No need to come up with like any fancy plays. Get your king to safety as fast as you can. In general, that's a very good idea that uh, you can stick to. I think strategically speaking, already our position is close to winning because his king long term is just going to be super vulnerable. It will take us a little bit of time to maneuver our pieces, improve the position until we prove that. But already I can tell, I think black has a pretty large advantage. Okay, bishop d2, good move. Threatening some kind of potential tricks with this... Uh, thingy over there but i think there's nothing wrong with castling since 95 i believe that there is simply queen takes on d2 and bishop takes on c6 there is pawn takes so i see nothing wrong with it he just goes queen g3 there is one hanging pawn However, I think simplest, you see the bishop uh, there, better 
you just avoid any potential tricks. Go queen back. That's fine. You don't have to like really rush with that when you have such a positional domination. And when bishop h6 happens, knight e8 is usually the standard way to defend. Also consider knight h5 to be a bit more aggressive hitting the queen. Also g6 is not a terrible move. You'd be surprised uh, how strong I actually believe g6 is in this position. Just uh, sacrificing the exchange because he's got a lot of weakened dark squares around his king. I think the line goes like bishop takes, queen takes 92 though. Which is maybe not as clear. So I think I'm just gonna stick with the standard play. These rating ranges, as I was saying, even though sometimes I just go crazy and sacrifice stuff because I'm a degen, playing tight is usually the way to go. Just defending. Next, okay, what we can do? Sidestep. Now this is a threat, so get rid of that annoying bishop. He's gonna do like what? Bishop f4? Can think of exchanging it. Bishop e3. Oh, see? Simply you sidestep these things, they don't even notice you make threats. Take it. Rook g8 next. Perhaps even uh, win the queen. So, yeah. Usually opponents don't really pay attention to your moves, and once they play bishop h6 and it stays there for longer than a move, for somehow. In this, in their brain, they just have this idea that, okay, the bishop on h6 is untakeable forever. It's just immortal. That's how they see this uh, position. But I mean, just sidestep and, uh, I mean, the bishop has to go back. And unless, you know, these things may happen and we're going to be winning another minor piece since he's going to be forced to play knight g6. Going to be up two pieces. Not a whole lot of opponent can do about it. Yeah, I'll take the queen. Sure. I don't mind. Just very easy play. Okay. Sure, you may be uh, saying that nobody really finds queen e5 in 680 games. Well, that's why you're watching this video to get down the theory. Free info. Remember that, and I think uh, you have all the chances to spot that during the game. Don't get me wrong, like here bishop g4 is like completely fine. If you are having problems remembering queen a5, just go bg4. It's like really easy move to equalize. Just queen a5 I like to play uh, because I have no life, so uh, I do these things uh, sometimes. Okay, rook e1, just queen takes on f3. Forcing rook g2, just... I mean, keep collecting stuff. Maybe I have missed h4, maybe not. Okay, guys, this is like the, I think, a very good exercise where you can try to pause the video and think about uh, what would be like the nicest conversion here, just to simplify everything. Uh, make a nice transition into an easily winning endgame because bishop takes on e3 would be ideal but see it doesn't let me play the move because it we're pinned also queen takes on e3 is not ideal because the pawn takes us queen d1 check may be tempting but rook g1 not very clear however we can take the rook only move king takes and then we can take the other rook pawn takes and let's say we move the knight. And in that position, we have a clean extra rook in the end game. That's uh, just an easy win. Nothing to like actually be worried about. Knight back, full extra rook. Honestly, we're better in this end game if you even take the rook off the board. Just f5, restricting the bishop. King f6 next. Going to bring the rook onto the open file. Okay, 95, we should be able to get uh, a checkmate soon. I mean, he's in a pretty awkward mating net, just need uh, something to deliver the checkmate. I mean, we'll take the free bishop and just take like the free pawns now. Just gonna go for like the easiest conversion. And we managed to force the resignation. So, uh, yeah, nothing too fancy there. 
Just, I think, uh, standard play. I'm telling you guys. Remember what I said in the video. Lower rated players play very loose, very aggressive for no reason. Now, try to come up with a good reason why somebody would play the move queen e5, yeah? This is literally the players that you need to win against. How do you win against them? Not by playing any kind of brilliant masterpiece and, you know, getting the records book, but playing solid, playing very tight, sometimes even passive if uh, required. They're just gonna come up with stuff like this. Um, just weakening their position too much. See, bishop h6, just like bishop hanging, threatening mate in one. Of course, they are like very loose and uh, forget about uh, their um, hanging pieces. And uh, this is just kind of um, how you want to punish them. This is like the perfect picture. Extra piece, trap their king and queen. And you just get, um, get a free win with that uh, without having to do much at all. Just exploit uh, your opponent that's overextending. Quick interruption. If you're really enjoying this kind of content, please consider liking the video because it really helps the algorithm boost the video to more people. You know that is very much appreciated, so let's just jump uh, right back into the action. All right, looks like we've got ourselves a new game and we're facing a 600 rated opponent. Let's see what he has in mind to do against our beloved uh, opening. So we see the Nice little center going for the main line and <clears throat> C9 C3. So this is the so-called classical variation where I'm a huge fan of just going DE followed by Knight F6. Okay. If you're looking for an interesting line, I think uh, A6 is a pretty tricky idea that uh, was explained in uh, my video about uh, how Magnus Carlsen likes to play the Karo Khan. He has a lot of this kind of interesting uh, sidelines uh, up his sleeve. And we're not going to do that now. I mean, I'm definitely having in mind to do a Karo Khan with the uh, sidelines, like a Karo Khan rating climb with sidelines only in the future. But for now, just sticking with the good old main lines. By the way, typical mistake there. People forget to take, they go knight f6 and white pushes e5 and uh, they're just like in trouble already. So make sure to destroy white's center first. And then uh, I like to go for knight f6. Bishop to f5 is another um, yeah, very popular move. Nothing wrong with that. Um, as a sideline, uh, h6, I think was getting like played occasionally, but um, again, we're not really gonna do that here. So just sticking to uh, mainline theory, just uh, start attack over now. Normally they take one out of like four games, you're gonna get to face stuff like knight g3 when they avoid start attack over. If bishop to d3, that's like a typical, uh, let's say uh, inaccuracy, because you can just take uh, the free pawn on d4 since white has no useful discovery. We see the knight trade though, we always take with the e pawn. <clears throat> I'm not like a big fan of taking with the g pawn, even though that could be interesting, specifically if uh, white has the knight and f3, but let's like not really dive into many complicated lines. This is the position that you're gonna reach in most of your games if you are uh, going for a Tartak War. Uh, at the top level, uh, c3 move is uh, by far the most played one with bishop d3 queen c2 ideas to long castle which uh, i think was uh, mainly explained in the uh, video that uh, we have about how david howell plays the karo khan yes the one that's like three hours long if you haven't uh, got to watch it yet now just knight f3 this is what you're gonna usually face and here white has two main plans Either bishop d3, which is similar to bishop c4, or bishop e2. And against these lines, we usually, well, rely on the bishop to g4 pin. When the bishop is on e2, we no longer play that, since uh, <clears throat> it's simply not uh, as effective as it is right now. When the queen cannot like really leave this diagonal, as we will be taking with uh, doubling up uh, white pawns now. As a rule of thumb, in the Tartakover, we never take on f3 
unless white is forced to like take back with a g pawn and just create a massive weakening as long as they can recap with a queen we never do that we always retreat back to h5 keeping annoying pressure on the knight now a lot of these guys just uh, don't have patience and play g4 this guy played uh, d5 which is a new move uh, i'm not like super sure how to deal with this honestly i've done like plenty of rating clients before but I've got to say, this is something that uh, definitely makes me think. C5 is definitely the main candidate that I have. Of course, first I consider CD, but then I'm thinking, okay, what if it's going to be like uh, Queen takes D5, I play Knight C6, it's going to get like Rook D1, annoying pressure, so that's no bueno. And then I'm thinking, okay, Bishop is a pretty nice blockade in general on D6, how about just C5, 97, 95? That is something that's quite appealing right now, at least. Can't really seem to come up with a better alternative. We may very well stick to that. Rook e8 also could be an interesting move, just letting him take. But I'm, I think c5 is also interesting because it's mainly blocking his bishop. So the bishop on c4 is restricted by the d5 pawn, while this bishop is quite active, even though it is mainly a blockading piece right now. So. Next up, this is uh, very much on the agenda, trying to finish development, the queen could go to c7, connecting the rooks, already have an idea of knight e5, there is bishop takes on f3 if I wanna trade a lot of pieces with knight e5 because that's forcing queen e2, protecting the bishop. In general, the trades um, are in white's favor, in the tartak over, whenever you've got the tartak over structure, <clears throat> obviously we've got these double pawns which uh, on the bright side our king is uh, usually ultra safe but uh, the downside of it is that all the end games uh, white sort of has an edge with this four against three majority so we gotta rely on dynamic play now this dynamic play could be something like rookie four maybe activating we've got ideas of uh, <clears throat> rookie three sacrificing the exchange sometimes I actually don't mind sacrificing the exchange. I don't think it's like the best move, but I think uh, could potentially end up being quite instructive. It's not like a tactic or anything like that. It's more of like a positional sacrifice, just trying to say that uh, White's got this uh, weak squares around. Uh, okay, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of breaking the first rule of the rating line that I should be making moves that I believe uh, 600 are uh, able to find but I mean maybe some 600 wouldn't see that the pawn protects the bishop I don't know just saying guys you don't have to like click away of the video okay you can still keep watching it won't hurt anybody plus it may uh, help you win 5 rating points after a uh, hour long session <laughs> let's just go to key eight hitting the pawn and the thing is i think my opponent's position is not going to be that easy to play that's sort of the main argument i could be completely wrong but i'm just gonna start creating these little threats and see how he's gonna respond also definitely interesting move was c4 just trying to restrict the enemy bishop that was maybe something i should have uh, paid a little bit more attention to not super sure i mean i'm also keeping ideas of cb4 and just uh recovering a pawn place g4 bishop g6 only move i don't think there's a lot to calculate after rook e3 since that's making absolutely no threat so yeah no need to waste time with uh, that move and just gonna avoid that threat still Opponent has to sort of deal with this. Rook takes on e3 idea. His king is now a little bit vulnerable, so he just plays knight h4. His opponent looks to be crazy because he's willing to take on g6 at seems. But this guy doesn't know that uh, the pawn cube is a win by force. So just get into the pawn cube, no matter, like down an exchange, whatever. One cube is always a win. I think that's already, if you are not aware of that in 2023, 
are you even like following the Karo Khan meta right now? Or I don't know. Uh, okay, jokes aside, we do have a great position since his king is like super weak. I could take the pawn on h3, but that would not be the most efficient way. I'm going to give a check saying that uh, king h1 is somewhat forced because king h2 allows a uh, nasty discovery hitting the queen. And uh, king f2 also didn't seem uh, like such a nice move to make for him. Maybe we can try to activate our pieces, hitting the queen and threatening bishop e3 ideas. Just curious to see how opponent is going to deal with uh, this move. Now, if I go bishop e3, he is probably willing to run away. So I'm not uh, going to be letting him off the hook this easily. I'm going to play rook e3, hitting the queen and cutting this king in uh, this little box that you see right there. It's almost like a Christmas box, if you think about it. And then, oh, we're going to be taking his queen. So that's, I guess, a late Christmas present, but... We've got actually quite an interesting uh, material balance to discuss because opponent got two rooks, I've got a queen who's better, like two rooks um, equals 10, so like 5 plus 5, the queen is usually like 9 points, uh, I mean these days could be worth like 10 points due to inflation, maybe, but uh, I think the main factor that should be decisive here, why um, should you pick any side? is the fact that the enemy king is super weak and uh, that's just making the queen way better. Like, let's say if the enemy king was safe and the, there were open files for the rooks, white could easily be better. But uh, because of the king being in, like, such a naked spot, I mean, the king is wide open. This is definitely very unpleasant. Rook f3 I was hoping for, winning the rook, but opponent defends better. Now, c4 could be interesting. I'm gonna start with like uh, 95, I think. I mean, c4 is a move too. I'll just do 95. Not super sure of uh, what I'm trying to do against uh, bc5. Sorry to disappoint you guys. I think just queen g2. Seems to be allowing some uh, unnecessary card play. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be super honest with you, but that I think we should be covered. C4, C3 looks to be trapping the enemy king in a mating net. I'm gonna go this far and say that. The king's gonna go to like C1. And then how do we... Finish him off. I think just queen e3. Okay, that's also an alternative. I'm just gonna go queen g2. Rook f2, I want queen e4. Oh, he goes king e3, but then queen d2 seems uh, quite promising. King e4, and surprising that there is no checkmate yet. King e4, we need only one check, but. I don't really see it. Yeah. I can take d6, that's like the easiest, but uh, probably just better to pick up this pawn with check and then give another check and then pick up d6. That is like one of the main reasons why the queen is to be preferred when the enemy king is like so insanely vulnerable as in this position. The queen can do whatever while the rooks are just watching the game. Rooks are doing absolutely nothing right now. Just gonna give a little check. King c5 and then b6. Is that a pawn checkmate? There we go. All right. That was a little bit of a, of a longer, let's say interesting uh, game. <laughs> so starting with the opening, d5 definitely kind of confused me a little bit. I think we can turn on the analysis and uh, see what the computer uh, wants to do against d5. Like until that moment, I had this game like so many times, but um, 
Yeah, on D5, I sort of uh, consider rook E8 as being uh, a good move in this position, just like not doing anything and keeping the tension. But then I was like, C5 is just looks very interesting to play, making his bishop uh, a bit more passive. He's just equal according to the computer. So pretty happy about it. 97. We quickly got a better position. And I mean, now you can definitely play something like rook c8 and just have an easy, slightly better position, I think, in general. But wanted to make it interesting and go rook e3. Still, computer says it's like minus, uh, minus one, around equal. It's just kind of hard that uh, white pieces don't really have any squares. Like, I knew the exchange sack was promising, but honestly, when I played it, I was sort of thinking that maybe white could somehow be objectively better, but we should be able to show off some like instructive ideas on how to restrict white pieces, but... Uh, Learn to be none of that. Um, since I was fine the whole time. So, surprised that rook takes on e3 was this strong in this position. This is just sort of like a Petrosian type of sacrifice, just um, not having like a concrete idea in mind, but playing for, um, yeah, positional domination. Queen e7 would have been more interesting also, just uh, hitting uh, e3. But also, I don't really hate the way I play this. Uh, as long as you get rook e8, uh, how is white gonna ever use the extra exchange? Is he gonna like attack on the f-file? I don't really see that coming with uh, these bad boys on uh, on the f-file and uh, this bishop like kind of restricted by the pawn. Uh, I kind of doubt that white can ever make progress here. So I hope you find this uh, exchange sack somewhat instructive and. Uh, with that being said, we can move on to the next game. All right, all right, all right. Getting the black pieces and this time facing a 900 rated opponent. If I had to guess, I'd be expecting an exchange variation, but let's see uh, whether that's going to be the case or not. Of course not. I'm not good at guessing, so we do get the advance and we're going to be sticking with our guns and uh, it's going to be interesting when we get the first guy to go D takes on C5. Uh, so far, we have faced everything but that. I'm expecting a lot of bishop b5 check, c3 or knight f3 type of moves. Uh, so, c3 it is. This is, I think, the most common one that you're going to encounter. Important now to start with knight c6 and not taking on d4. That would be inaccurate because you will get an option of playing knight c3. I explain that all the time on the channel. So, I'm going to go too deeply into that. And now, either bishop b5 or knight f3 is what uh, I normally see in this position. However, white has other moves as well, like perhaps f4, bishop e3. Those are occasionally tried uh, as well. But we do see the main move and now, by far, you really wanna pay attention here, okay? Wake up. If you're sleeping, this is where you really wanna be careful with your uh, move order. Because everyone literally, well, my students will just pre-move the move bishop g4. Giving white the chance of going DC and then that is leading to very unclear positions. So way simpler now. CD4 first, then we get the pin. They are forced to take that way. They cannot take with a knight because that will drop the E5 pawn. So very simple. And now we get into the most important structure that you want to understand in case you are uh, looking forward to play the C5 variation against the advance. So what is the main battlefield? We really want to focus on the d4 square, okay? So first, we do pin the knight. And as a rule of thumb, whenever they play h3 in the advance, we're going to give up the bishop for the knight. Literally all the time. And now, how do we develop these pieces? Because people usually will have uh, problems uh, developing their king side in the Karo Khan because there is less space. The knight cannot go to the f6 square as it normally would love to because of this pawn. And from my experience, a lot of people are struggling here. So, really important, remember always what's the main battlefield. It's d4. So, we're going to go e6, and then the knight is heading towards f5, usually. I mean, now, because he played bishop b5, maybe he'll end up 
taking uh, his brother on c6. So uh, we get h3, gonna be taking all the time. So you see, I'm literally doing nothing but applying the rules that I explained. Can't take the pawn because of the pin. The check is not yet uh, that effective because of uh, knight c3. So I'm just gonna play knight e7. I'm just a guy that's developing, literally doing nothing special. Preparing to play uh, knight f5 onto the next move. Now I'm actually a little bit intrigued by this position since knight f5 would give him ideas to take, give me a bit of a weak pawn on c6. So therefore, I really want to play a6 because that's forcing him to take. And we're going to get a very simple position that's, I think, just at least equal for us with the knight. He cannot really retreat because bishop a4, b5 has to move the bishop and then the pawn remains undefended. So he's literally forced to take, otherwise he is losing the d4 pawn. So we're gonna win back the bishop pair and uh, we have a target and the opponent does not. So um, I think we're in a pretty decent position. Hitting uh, this guy, he's gonna play bishop e3 or rook to d1, I expect. Uh, knight to c3, hanging the free pawn. Now I could really take, okay? This is the position where I could take. And that's like an easy win. But I think perhaps a little bit more instructive for um, our goal here with the video would be to just have this kind of equal position and uh, show you how easily you can outplay these guys even from what it looks like a completely equal and symmetrical position. So first of all, he goes queen g3, which is not a bad move. And if I castle, I'm going to lose the exchange because of bishop h6. g6, bishop takes, queen takes, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be down an exchange. So I've got to be careful already. Now, I've got the option of playing g6. And that will allow him to go bishop to h6. Now I can, of course, pick up the default pawn anytime. So here, I don't think castling is such a good move. Sometimes you can even sacrifice the exchange, but I don't think here we really get uh, any compensation. So I'm not going to castle, but I'm going to go g6. And I'm just hoping he'll realize this is hanging defend, because if he plays bishop h6, I'm going to kind of have to grab on d4. Just playing g6, hoping we get to castle, and then I hope we're going to get to show some uh, typical uh, queenside play for black. But we'll see. Opponent taking a little bit of time here. He should definitely watch out for that. And here it goes. Bishop e3 covering this. Just gonna get castled. And the very next move, rook on the open file. I don't care what he's gonna play at all. I could literally pre-move this. You can never go wrong with a rook on the open file. So that's what I'm gonna do. He should do the same. He should be putting a rook on the c file himself. Either this one or that one. Okay, he goes bishop h6. Hitting my rook. Now... There's actually a very interesting uh, exchange sack, allowing bishop takes on f8 and taking back. I think that's completely fine. But you don't need to sacrifice material against these guys. You just play solid, give them nothing, and uh, okay, just play simple chess by the rules, and you're gonna see that opponent will uh, literally self-destruct soon. I'm gonna go rook c8, and... Uh, I think I can go b5, knight a5, knight c4 and sort of try to induce some weakening. But it may also be an interesting uh, exercise to just play waiting moves and uh, let my opponent self-destruct. That's also quite effective. Now if I play b5, I'm a little bit worried of b4. And then it's not easy to utilize my knight. So I think I'm going to start with knight a5 right away. Just preparing to play uh, knight c4 and perhaps follow it up with uh, b5. I'm going to start applying a little bit of pressure, okay? Not a lot. Just improving the knight. I literally finished development. There is not such an amazing square for the queen, so that's why I'm not rushing with it. And what piece can be improved? I mean, everything is kind of ideally played, so then the knight remains uh, the only answer to that question. So... Play knight a5, just uh, try to bring it over to c4. Create half of a threat, okay? Not even a big threat. Just getting the knight that it's going to be annoying for opponent. And uh, usually these guys, you make half a threat, they freak out. See, knight e2. I didn't even get to play knight c4, and I feel like he already made a mistake. 
Because now I can play Ruxito. Hitting these two things. But just gonna keep it very simple. As I was saying earlier, infiltrating is usually the best move. I'm not even gonna do that here. Just continue with my plan. Be consequent. You have one idea, try to stick to it. You know there is this saying that uh it's better to have a bad plan than uh, having no plan at all. I think that's not true, but we're going to stick to it here. Yes, that's uh, making absolutely no sense, but I guess this is why you're watching this channel. So, knight c4. Let's try to understand my opponent. Is he going to play rook b1? That's a bit too passive even for him, so he goes b4. Yeah, now, these pawns are target. What do we do with targets? We undermine them, okay? This before pawn is usually called a hook. And we can just use a5, hit the pawn, most likely trade a pair of pawns, but then the other guy on a3 is going to be really vulnerable. So uh, that's what we do. We've got a bit of a target. We attack it. I've got a stronger knight. He has a passive knight. I think uh, black's position is to be preferred. So let's see. He could do rook b1. But still, I could take, and uh, I am definitely enjoying my position. I don't think there's like a winning blow yet or anything like that. I mean, you shouldn't think uh, that way. But uh, we have easy moves. We've got like nothing to risk here. You see that I literally have no weaknesses. I mean, the only thing I have to watch out for is... I need to not allow his queen to reach f6 and somehow get the mate. Even though, even if that happens, I have bishop f8 and probably still safe. Let's go b5. Uh, making the mistake finally, because the a3 is now waiting to be taken. I'm going to take with my bishop, just keeping my uh, ultra active knight. Now, with this move, he's threatening to take the knight first, and then the bishop on a3 will remain undefended. I think it is smart to just go back uh, home. Could also play bishop f8. Well, I mean just bishop e7. I don't think this bishop is particularly threatening in any way. So why would, would I trade it? And next up, you can continue with either queen b6 picking up the other pawn. Or just play rook a8 start pushing the pawn and literally all of his pieces will need to guard that pawn in order for it not to queen which will give me a lot of freedom to either pick up the b5 pawn or usually win his center please knight c3 so stopping me from uh, pushing but there should be some sort of drawback to this. Now I'm thinking queen b6 could be interesting. Hitting d4. He's most likely going to go rook fd1. And then how do we win? Again, maybe not the best way of thinking about this. I think just uh, sticking with the initial plan, rook a8. Maybe he'll try to block it. I don't know. That could be a thing. Don't really believe in uh, believe in it that much. But why would I give him this blockading square? After all, I'm thinking to literally just play a retreating move. The knight is very juicy there, but what good if I cannot push? I wonder. So literally just thinking to play knight b6. Now, if he plays rook a1, I'm considering. Uh, Simply going rook a8. Because if I go bishop b4, then bishop g5 could be a bit annoying. If I go rook a8, push a4, a3, yeah. I think that's uh, quite nice. Making some sort of progress. Yeah, rook a1, rook a8. Okay, rook a1, bishop b4 also. Interesting, but uh, I think that's simplest. Just preparing to do this next. Get the pawn all the way to a3 if I can. Support it with a rook. Knight c4. And just get into that position where I was saying that all of his pieces will have to babysit the a pawn. And then we can take over the center most likely. Now opponent is also in a massive time uh, trouble. So unfortunately we might be able to win this game by flagging. But hopefully 
He's gonna hang on for a couple of moves and uh, we get to show the power of the black's position. Also, by the way, uh, previously he's threatening now to take, so I'm just gonna play rook eight. Previously, when my knight is on c4, I think many of you were wondering why not go knight e2 or something like that. Please keep in mind the bishop covered uh, that square, so that was never really an option. And yeah, now I'm gonna get the pawn to a3 as promised. Knight is going to c4 next, protecting it. Opponent flags, so unfortunately we don't really get to show uh, my ideas, but uh, position was completely winning. Um, yeah, here as I was saying, just um, you could definitely take the free pawn below 1200, I think. You're gonna get like so many free pawns on d4, it's just insane. So watch out for those, obviously you should take them. I just played bishop e7 for the sake of the video to make it a little bit more interesting. And now, the sort of only interesting decision that I have to make, okay, we can check this out with a computer. I really like knight a5, okay? Because if you go b5, I thought perhaps white goes b4 and I wasn't sure how we're gonna make progress since we can no longer get the knight. And if you ever go a5, that's most likely going to be a trade of pawns because b5 is weakened as well. So, didn't like b5, it just felt like getting the knight to c4 is going to be way more annoying for my opponent. And after a5, I think he still he should be okay if he doesn't uh, play b5. I was thinking a move such as rook b1 should be reasonable for my opponent. But still, I quite like my position after something like this with... Queen b6 coming, the other rook is coming over c8. Just a slightly easier position to play and uh, most likely your opponents will just uh, blunder like crazy in these positions below 1500. So you don't need to like actually play a perfect game to win it. So, uh, okay. With that being said, I think we can move on to the next game. All right, all right. Getting another game, this time against uh, a 700 rated opponent. And I'm actually so happy that we get to play against this variation because I feel like so many people struggle against this for absolutely no reason. Because after d5, e5, what is gonna happen is most people just play the move uh, bishop to f5, yeah? Maybe just wait to get that position on the board. I'm really expecting him to advance. And yeah, this is the position where I think most of the Karokan beginners are just gonna be playing bishop to f5. Which is not bad, it's actually absolutely fine. But what ends up happening after, you play e6 and then you don't know what to do with these pieces because normally you're used to get the knight uh, towards f5, but the bishop is there. And people are just now like so frustrated and don't really know what to do with their kingside pieces. They just play much worse after that. So, the cure for this, you just think of this as, okay, they're playing advance. So what do we do against the advanced variation? We play c5, knight c6. We're waiting for them to play knight f3 so that we can pin the knight with bishop g4. And we try to literally apply the same rules as against the advanced. Now, because he checks me, I could definitely play bishop d7 and trade them. But I think for the sake of uh, the video, knight c6 might be a little bit more instructive. I'm just gonna do that. In case he takes, I'm pretty happy that uh, he's giving me the bishop pair and I'm probably gonna give it back anyways, but uh, it's improving our control towards the center whenever a trade on the c6 square happens. Uh, yeah, anyways, I cannot seem to draw any arrows, so we'll just have to visualize it. Now, queen f3 is definitely a typical uh, opening mistake because the queen is not really doing uh, anything that uh, useful on f3. It's just developing sort of randomly and uh, taking away the square of the knight, which is kind of bad. So in this position, you've got like many ways of playing this. You could just go e6 and go for the French play with a bad bishop. You could uh, play knight h6, just preparing bishop d4. But I think what is actually quite uh, more interesting would be the move h5. I think that's uh, kind of an interesting computer concept, just preparing bishop g4. but now that the queen is on f3, perhaps bishop f5 is not such a bad move. Maybe even easier. But I'm going to stick with h5, okay? I really want to show you this idea. It is not necessarily something that um 700 guy would have 
been able to play. But I think it'd be quite instructive. So plays knight e2. By the way, if he plays h3, I think we can still go bishop g4. That's a pretty cool trick that I'll show you after the game. Still probably not the best move, but uh, it's just kind of a funny trick. And now we just get bishop g4. And literally next, knight's coming over to f5. We just play the same. So ooh, we've got queen c3 hitting the pawn on c5. Okay, always when the opponent makes a move, you need to ask yourself, what is he trying to do? So queen c3 sidestepping my threat and obviously hitting this pawn. So we can just start with e6, opening up bishop's trap and defending it. Now, in case of any h3, we just take on e2. Bishop is safe. Plays d4. Now, taking would be a bit of a mistake because that allows bishop takes on c6 and the queen's path is opening up. So I can do a move like rook c8. But if you think about it, then dc5 could happen and not very simple to actually regain the pawn. Oh, by the way, I just got an idea earlier. H5, no, never mind. Never mind, it's not important what uh, I was thinking. So, okay, besides any like rook c8 prophylactical moves, I mean, we can also consider bishop takes on e2. If he takes with a bishop, then we just win a free pawn. The bishop takes on e2 is kind of forcing him to take with a king, if you think about it. Which, yeah, it's not really what a doctor ordered in most of the cases. Do we want to play for that? We we'll also start with queen b6. I think I'm just going to start with queen b6. Developing the queen, putting pressure in the center, hitting the bishop, overprotecting the knight. I think queen b6 is one of the most useful moves that uh, we had right now. After bishop takes, you could definitely take with a queen. I think that's fine, but I think I'm just going to stick to the standard play, taking with a pawn. In case he takes, I'm like, okay with that. I've got ideas to still take when he to pick up the d4 pawn because the queen from b6, is still uh, putting pressure on the d4 square. Let's see. White is actually quite behind in development, so you see the move D takes on C5. Now, taking with a queen and getting an endgame would be interesting, but bishop takes on C5 is by far the most natural move. I even had a threat of playing bishop before, and we also get to develop the bishop, which is to be prioritized. Now, in all these F4 lines, when the bishop is no longer able to capture the H6 knight, you could develop it using this route. And I think I'm going to do it here, because... What could actually happen sometimes in these lines, whenever you play 97, you gotta watch out for c3, b4, and the bishop could get trapped. That is why uh, I think it's just a little bit nicer to use the h6 route this time, but the final destination is the same. The knight is heading towards uh, f5. So h3, whenever this happens, give the bishop for the knight, no surprise on that. Knight is reaching final destination, but threatening to go on to g3, so opponent has to be careful about that and uh, just look at this position. Move 13, we're playing black pieces, but one move away from castling and connecting rooks, and still look at white. Didn't castle, still these pieces stuck on the queen side. This is simply the result of uh, developing efficiently, and now he tries to catch up on development, but uh, just allows me to go for the very simple and obvious fork. And we just win the game like that, just with very simple development, very solid against a line where like so many people struggle when white plays f4, you could just do the advance and you're going to get a simple game like that. Okay, knight a4, I'm just going to give the check, he has to play knight back onto c3, usually there is a d4 motive to win a piece, but you want to watch out for queen takes on c6, so... We don't really want to give him any counterplay. So I think uh, we could just try to rescue the knight perhaps. Move like knight f2. He's going to go bishop d2 and maybe that is not as clear as I uh, want it to be. Yeah, I think I'm just going to stick with that. Just rescuing the knight. Bishop d2. I'm going to play knight e4 anyways using a little bit of a tactical trick. Um, I could have played h4, knight g3 as well. There were like 
many ways of uh, getting the knight back, but um, yeah, I, I thought this was the simplest. Now we're just gonna exchange, but up material, so trades are very welcome. I'm gonna bring back the knight, still taking advantage of the pin. The very next move, uh, we can go for knight takes on c3, and uh, we are up a full rook. So we're just gonna try to exchange everything, place our rook onto the open b file, and uh, the opponent shouldn't really be able to generate any card play like at all. So let's see what he wants to do. I'm a little bit low on time, but uh, definitely I've had worse uh, <laughs> games when it comes to the time management. So. Not really particularly concerned about that. I'm just gonna be taking on C3 here, and that is a free pawn on F5 that uh, we're gonna grab. In case he plays D6, I think we just get the heck out of here by castling. And after EF, you can simply recap with the rook, E7, rook E8. The pawn is not uh, as strong on E7 because it's gonna be lacking support, so. Perhaps just a weak pawn that we're gonna be able to collect in the following moves uh, quite easily. So he goes for queen to g5, but that's leaving uh, c3 undefended, which we're gonna collect. Pick up the rook on the very next move, and uh, yeah, then just looking forward to eliminate this guy on e7, trade queens. <laughs> That's a funny move. I have literally nothing but to capture his queen. And okay, opponent finally resigns and uh, we managed to get a game. So I don't think we missed uh, any critical moments in this game. I just wanted to quickly check what this Waker Stockfish thinks about uh, H5 move. I mean, not even among the top. A bit surprising. Let's play it on the board maybe. He'll think it's interesting. Yeah, okay. Apparently, knight c3 would have been uh, a strong move now for him. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I get the active bishop. Now, apparently, it's best to just uh, play the move e6 and have like a French position. So, for that reason, uh, I think objectively speaking, bishop f5 would have been the very best, but um, very close. Anyways, hope that's like an interesting idea that you can use to. Uh, Get bishop to g4 in these lines. It's specifically strong against uh, another line that usually comes from the advance after c3, knight c6. And now when they play f4, there is a threat of bc. And usually it's very nice to take and now play the move h5. This is uh, where it like really starts shining and uh, like has a very nice game in these positions in general. So uh, with that being said, I think we can move on to the next game.